three. Welcome to the New York Parrot Literary Corner. My name is Dustin Pickering. I am your anchor. Uh, we have Paul Kanicki today, who lives and writes in Dallas, Texas. He was chosen for the John Ashbery Homeschool Residency. His poems feature in Richard Bailey's movie, One of the Rough, distributed by A-V-I-F-F -F Canis. His books are available from Cleft Jaw Press, Night Ballet Press, Dark Particle Press, and Spartan Press. He also sits on the editorial board of Thimble Literary Magazine. So Paul, anything that you would like to talk about uh, to tell us uh, from the beginning about yourself that's not mentioned in the bio, please feel free to speak up. Okay. Well, well, well thank you. And, and it's nice meeting you, Dustin, and hello, New York Parrot Literary Center and, and all the ships at sea. It's uh, <laughs> funny the way, to me, things kind of uh, cross from time to time. Just recently, I, I found out about you all through the Kevin Bacon of the poetry small press scene, my good friend, John Dorsey. So you all had had him on yeah. and then uh, things had come together. It, it was a it was a kind of a magic it was kind of a magic evening out of a crazy night i met john dorsey when he and mj taylor i don't know if you know mike taylor the great poet mike taylor's son mm -hmm. mj who's just a beautiful guy and a great writer and he and dorsey were in the audience where what i swear to god i was performing in milwaukee at a burlesque house mm -hmm. he was doing some poetry there on stage and had the chance to meet them. And Cleft Jaw Press had put together that show while simultaneously they were doing another show um, at the beach there in Venice in, in, in Southern California. So again, just to say, I thought it was cool that you'd had my friend uh, John recently, and he is definitely the Kevin Bacon of the, <laughs> of the poetry world for sure. Excellent. Uh, yes, we did. We did have a great interview with him and he was fun to talk to and uh, that's available on uh, our channel as well. So to kick things off, I'm going to ask a kind of general question. Um, sure. So do you write as a response to the world or to start a discussion with the world? Wow. A response or a discussion. Great, great question. Um, it, it, is, it is part of what I've come to identify about myself mm -hmm. that I will be in as an identity. I will be in my writing practice every day. And uh, why I kind of preface my answer to say I am responding to the minutes and the hours in the past that has made up my life. Many poems mm -hmm. come from there. And then also as a poet of witness in response to things that are going around uh, on around me. But if I'm lucky, if I'm lucky, I hit a note, some kind of tuning fork of the reader's heart and maybe that begins a discussion. Mm -hmm. So I guess secretly that's my, um, my hope is that it can reach out, touch somebody, get them thinking about something, get them saying, hey, I'm not alone in this particular feeling. Look, this guy is having this feeling. And or if it ran into a full-blown discussion, that would be yeah, a great thing. Interesting. So do you think poems can, so you seem to think also, and I think this is true myself, that poems can still be controversial, even though that's sort of a, underground activity for the most part at this at this point in history it's you know can they still stir arguments and discussions and and get people reeling you know i i think of a mentor i have here in dallas a great guy named joe malazzo amazing writer amazing artist just an amazing human and i i, I think of a line from him it, it, you can always turn back in again to the writing if it's good enough. So mm -hmm. can something be to this or to that? 
man, just when I thought like, I, I don't know why I'm in Dallas. I don't know why this example came up, but I would have said, you can't do a JFK poem. And then I ran, uh, and then I read, uh, and are, are we PG-13 here or, or as yeah. far as language? Yes, no okay. Language, whatever you think is necessary. <laughs> I read this Ocean Vuong poem about JFK's assassination. I'm like, fuck me, he did it. I'm like, you can't write about that subject. And then he killed it. Wow. So my thoughts are just that we're all going to sort of put those governors on ourselves. Mm -hmm. I would say this, to step outside and to kind of talk about myself from the audience. I love and I cherish groups that I have been a part of, like Poets on X Plus and Mad Swirl here in Dallas, mm -hmm. and also the Kansas City Poets that I did, the, the, the Kansas City Throwdown I featured there for many years. Those are poets of the street. And in the Bob Kaufman tradition, in the Jack Micheline tradition, that I hold so near and dear to my heart. But at the same time, I also love to dance with Sharon Olds and Joseph Brodsky and Sexton and Plath. And, and, and you know, fuck it if some people like this type of thing I do and some other people like this other kind of thing I do, I just feel like if I do it all well enough, there's more than enough minutes for us to enjoy it and try it all. So again, something in there mm -hmm. that you said sparked me to say, I, I'm always stretching to surprise. So I, I just feel like, uh, you know, a little Babe Ruth in the batter's box sometimes, man, I'll swing and miss a lot. But sometimes when I, when I hit one, like mm -hmm. I wrote this line, this is a poem not, not, not too long ago. Don't ask me what I do to make a living. Ask me what I do to make a life. And I'm like, where the hell did that come from? Hmm. So, you know, you, you, you spend like 10,000 hours. I don't know how many damn poems. And you're like, oh, that one's okay. Oh, this one, you know, I, I bet so-and-so will like this because you can think of friends that'll dig a certain mm -hmm. poem. But once in a while, you hit that line. I had this buddy here in Dallas, a great writer, Dan Collins, and he heard me host because pre-COVID, I had hosted several different shows going on here, poetry shows going on here in Dallas. And I, you know, I'd always try to dream something spontaneous up to kind of pump up the crowd for the evening. And I had said, I've written poetry. It is never written back. And my buddy, Dan, ended up using that line in a poem that won an award with New York Quarterly. And you know, money isn't everything, not having money is, but you know, sometimes mm. it, it, is, it is a symbol that you did something right if a whole bunch of people send in your poems and you were the one that you know, kind of pyramided your way up there. You can tell I get a little passionate if you <laughs> can be activated about poetry. I will absolutely get going a little bit there. So what is the literary scene in Dallas like? And that would be before and after COVID. Do they still host readings, uh, you know, maybe small scale? Great, great, great. And I'll, I'll, great question. For me, it begins with the literary center called the Writer's Garret. A mm -hmm. great poet now, now departed Jack Myers and his wife, Thea Temple, started uh, the Writer's Garret. And when I found them and, and another literary center here in town, Word Space, through that, I started finding some amazing open mics like Mad Swirl that's been going 15 years. They mix a little jazz with their poetry. Right now, they're Zooming it first Wednesdays of the month. Poet on, Poets on X Plus with Opalina Salas, Carlos Salas, Josh Weir, unbelievable. And then the program that I've, uh, the three that I've been lucky enough to host, Pandora's Box Poetry Showcase with my great buddy, 
Christopher Soden, who I'm going to talk about a book that he and I are, are, are doing together that's coming out soon from Spartan Press. But we got lucky enough that this little black box theater in the shadow of the Cotton Bowl of all places on the Texas State Fairgrounds in Dallas, this theater has been there since the 20s. They had um, premiered some of uh, Tennessee Williams' works. So There's like an amazing history. And mm -hmm. we said, instead of an open mic, let's do features in this theater so they can have just the poetry or they can have a backing movie. They can have a backing band. They can have whatever they want because it's a whole working theater. And that was Pandora's Box Poetry Showcase. Some unbelievable mm -hmm. times had people from all over the world. Then another one I did was called Vellum Ouroboros. And the idea there was when you got up to do a couple, this was an open mic, when you got up to do a couple of your poems, you had to start out with one that inspired you that was somebody else's. I don't care if it was your uncle's poem, your auntie's poem, Emily Dickens, whoever. And I had this whole, I love to set up like fake Easter egg, Abraham Lincoln quotes, so to speak. So I used to say that I inherited this series, hosting this series from the great, late great Jack Michelin. And I would start out with his poem to the poets. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, complete fabrication, but you know, just have it, having fun with it. And that bookstore where we did that one is called Deep Vellum, hence we called the show Vellum Ouroboros. What's interesting is in Dallas, our, um, what, what's the spot everybody goes to in New Orleans? Uh, why am I having a, a brain uh, uh, the, the, the vacation? Um, the big party area where everybody Mardi Gras, uh, French Quarter. Yeah, I was so gonna say French the friend, Quarter. The French Quarter of Dallas is called Deep Elm, and that's where all the blues men used to play, and now it's where all the rock bars are. And there's this great little bookstore and publisher called Deep Vellum there in Deep Elm, where I hosted that show, where I met my wife, the writer, Reverie Konecki. We fell in love and got married in that bookstore, officiated by another poet, before we left to go on honeymoon to feature the festival. So there was a whole hell of a lot of poetry done mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. And then her, her idea, Dallas has this very swanky central park called Clyde Warren Park, right down by all its museums and symphony halls and most beautiful area. And we did an outdoor show there called, her idea, because she's brilliant, called meet me with curiosity because what's more beautiful right now than to meet other human beings with curiosity instead of you know prejudice and rigid ideas and you, mm -hmm, you get it mm -hmm. the only problem the only problem with a show public like that thing about it is the public the worst thing about it is the public <laughs> so i promise you i i, I learned to go back to my bartending days and bouncing and just overall crowd control. But we had a beautiful, beautiful time there also. So some of those things may come back as COVID finally dies down and everybody starts getting, you know, fully vaccinated. But man, it sure has, uh, has changed the world for those kinds of things. So it seems like to answer kind of one part of your question, mm -hmm. it seems like everybody's still kind of zooming at right, this point right. till we can all uh, feel like we're, we're, we're safe again. But uh, I give you one more quick little uh, insight to something. If you're going to say, what do I believe in? I believe in collaborations and I believe in going to art with an open heart looking for nothing. You know, sometimes you go and somebody's got their art to sell and, and, and maybe they really do have like an electricity bill they're behind on or something, you know, I, 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 I could, but what I'm trying to rev up to is they give you their vibe. They're only going to stay for five seconds, try to sell their book and then run away. So I try to be the opposite of that and give looking for nothing in return. And I'll give you an example of where that worked out for me uh, unbelievably. 
So some friends were doing a, a reading in a little art gallery in Dallas. And they're like, hey, we, we've got some time. Get up and really rock it. You know, do a couple of poems. So I get up and I do a couple of poems. And I didn't know, but in the audience, there was a movie director. So we ended up exchanging information. He writes a movie. I write some poems for it. And then, of course, you can see I have a, a face for radio. So I do the, it's just my voice uh, narrating uh, the movie. And getting picked up by can shown here in the United States, shown in Europe, shown at the mm -hmm. Berlin Film Festival, shown at some universities. You got to be kidding me. All because one night, instead of going to bed early, I go down and I support a friend's show and the neat things that can that can happen, you know, and just like in life, the, always the best things are are unexpected. But yeah, it was a cool. So would, cool would you like to read us a poem? I would love to read you a poem. Let's see. We will start out with this poem from After Working Hours that was put out by Night Ballet Press. Uh, they're, they're out of Ohio. I don't know if you know Diane Besornik, but she's great and makes beautiful books. And I've got one. For a while, I was on a kick where I liked books with dual, the titles with dual meanings. You know, Reject Convention could also be Reject Convention. And After Working Hours could also be After Working Hours. But this one, <laughs> I wrote behind that bookstore, uh, Deep Vellum, where Reverie and I fell in love, and it's called Helen of the Broken Mouth. Mm -hmm. The sky breaks pink. The night is a painting of a train. You move like the earth turns in a bar fight about respect. I walk you to your ride. The air is cold. Sometimes frost makes the blade stick. You take another bite. Your flaws are like an instruction manual written in Chinese. If they're in there, I can't find them. Staring hard, you say Dallas is a man. Far off towers and addendum painted in beautiful tricks. But your eyes shake me for my truth. I say we are secrets the mother holds. Your fingers are photos pressed into stars. And the music light brings. Today, everything is perfect in its imperfection. Mm. Can you tell us a little bit about the story behind that? Yes. So I knew that this was a soulmate, a, a person for me because it wasn't just the way we got along. It, it was the way we would argue and the way she would challenge me to see something like, um, I, I, th that th there's, there's opportunity in conflict. There's some of the most opportunity to learn and to grow from conflict. Mm -hmm. And so that was a lot about me learning from her and I, my wife, and I, and I continue to every, every day. And you, you'll have to, uh, have to look out for some of her, some of her stuff coming mm -hmm. soon. But each one of the poems in After Working Hours was a tribute that I did to some poet that I've loved met on the road, read, or meant something to me because so many of us have that day job mm -hmm. grind and we've got to try to sneak that time in jealously for our, our writing practices. So that was absolutely what was going on there. And then of course, sometimes Frost makes the blade stick. If you get a chance, I'm an, a great Oliver Reed fan. Mm -hmm. And if you get a chance to slip in a, a line from, um, Gladiator, you know, you've got to do it. <laughs> I have a we can't question all... regarding um, the poem yes, titled please. My Father, I mean, I tried on my father's pants. 
Do you remember the poem? Yes. Uh, oh, I remember you, it well. Yes. Yeah. Could you just present the poem and uh, analyze the poem for our viewers? I would. I would love to. Thank you. Thank you. So this poem, as you'd mentioned, is titled "I Tried on My Father's Pants." I tried tough skin and corduroy, polyester, chino, cotton, rayon. I tried on my father's pants and they were too long. I traced pictures of scorpions on graph paper and hid them in miniature coin pockets of his jeans folded laser tight. I tried on overalls and the onesies mechanics wear. I tried on costumes and starch, spells, spelling, poison, five-figure death touch curses, nunchuck training. Don't ask me what I do to make a living. Ask me what I do to make a life. I am the still blue figure of the dead lake, the terrible mirror typing like a moon. I am the little boy waiting to grow eight legs and a barbed tail, sting the sun and the hand that placed it there, make a desert of the sky. Wonderful. Mm. Um, There's that line you mentioned there. Right. And, and thank you for asking me to, uh, to read that one. And that was up at uh, Blue Pepper Blogspot, which really puts up some sharp stuff. So I was happy that they put me up there recently online. So this brings me to an almost, when we talk about this poem, is in a series of poems that I've been working on over a year and, and soon to be published. So maybe many of us have had this great friend growing up and, and I did and, and his name was was Timmy Newman uh, unfortunately as he hit his later teenage years he did succumb to uh, paranoid schizophrenia and so I, I've gone back and I've, I've written about a lot of our adventures and what we went through together and um, there's a lot of that coming through here and 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 this poem if you ask me to analyze it something interesting comes to my mind Akhmatova told Joseph Brodsky make the poem a dark stain of nouns upon the page and there are times where you can get a great sense of almost like waterfall or, or, or avalanche or rolling down a hill in those moments with the costume starch, spells, spelling, poison, five finger death touches. That's, that's one of those moments. But then, because I've, you know, I've mentioned that quote to writer friends before, and I have this, this great friend, the Pulitzer Prize winning newspaper person and great poet, Gail Reeves King, who said to me, I agree with you, Paul, make the poem a dark stain of nouns upon the page. But when you do throw in that verb, make it a spear right through the chest. So I, 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 again, it, it, it's, it's, it's dangerous. You, you don't wanna to talk to somebody who just tried to start writing poems yesterday and just go, oh, make everything a list of nouns. <laughs> no, but th there are moments when the mew, you and the muse are riding together in a real gallop that those can be very powerful sections of a poem. I'll take you to um, my favorite. I have a real love hate with Bukowski, but one of his poems to Jane for all the love that I had to give, which is not enough. And he talks about, gods and chips of blinking things. You, you'll notice he gets into that same sort of a slipstream avalanche if you go in and, and revisit that for Jane poem. And um, it, it, it all ends with her dress, but they will not give it back to me. It's beautiful, beautiful poem. I, I think when he hit, he hit. I, I think, you know, if somebody wants to give you a million dollars to just shout out a ton of poems, you know, it, it, it happens to, you got to pick the, the jewels from the hay. But um, yeah, that, that poem has meant a lot to me in my series of poems. 
from the shoeless Timmy Newman, almost Martian Chronicles. If you don't mind, I'd love to share another one with you from that series. Okay. It was just recently up at, if you're not familiar with this site, as it ought to be magazine. And that's a really, it's a great site. Chase Dimmick runs that one. And he just published this recently called 1976. The bicentennial minute is playing on the cathode ray tube in the corner. In the yard around the house you'll own for 50 years. Half full November is an annual feast, 11, 12's gone, and I am 10. Someone said an old score. I am the skin of broken grapes. In the house alone to hide or burn it down, your drinking makes me drunk. Fire requires an accelerant. Hiding is another kind. Heart racing faster, holding one's breath takes oxygen away. The harder you try to be an empty room. Each year I blow one more candle, wishing beyond invisibility to disinvent myself. Hmm. The last line is a good, good, gives good pause for a reflection there. Um, so you're also serve on the editorial board of uh, Thimble Literary Magazine. What is it like to work with others on an editorial board? What is the process? Sure, it's a, a great, great question. If y'all haven't visited Thimble, it is such a beautiful site because this is not me, but there are some geniuses in knowing how to write all that code and making it look so beautiful, the art, the poems, the short stories, y'all ought to check it out. So the, the great Nadia Arioli is the editor in chief and she and Phil Cerrone started that mag, brought me on board. I was an editor for a little while and now, I'm on the editorial board and I am nothing but not, if not a cross pollinator, you can tell I'm gonna run around everywhere I go and sprinkle my enthusiasm for poetry and other people's art. Hey, Dustin, man, what have you got going? Let me, let's talk about your newest project and your, and your newest work. So Thimble is, kicking ass. What we are going to do on the editorial board is very new. To that note, one thing that, that we're doing, it, it, it's another um, committee that I don't happen to be a part of, but they're working on making sure and, and trying to help with artists having insurance. Because if you don't have the day job grind, then how are you going to stay healthy enough to make and be successful enough to make art to break over that kind of event horizon of no one knows who I am. Oh, now everybody knows who I am. And then maybe you can get yourself some insurance. So they're really trying to think outside the box in many different ways. Um, again, look for Nadia Arioli's uh, poetry everywhere you can because she's a genius. And Phil comes, Phil Cerrone comes from a theater background and they've done some interesting things in getting some of the poems produced and put up on stage with actors. So just trying to, to think outside of what you would normally see and, and get the art less underground and more overground. <laughs> whenever whenever possible interesting so what kind of uh, work do you guys look for at thimble anything do you have a specific aesthetic or that that is a great question they they are absolutely vehemently accepting of all types of peoples and you will go on there. I mean, th th there was a nun who had a badass. I mean, just to say you will never see so many varieties of different types of humans. And uh, 
it's just it's it's an it's an aesthetic that that I would say does your poem address something of the it seems like so many of the poems have something of a spark about the mysteries of the universe and what it means to be alive it, it, it's just mm -hmm. um that that work it, it it dances between you know it's kind of that university halls of literary style and that that every man that that every man style mm -hmm. and um maybe like a um if you've read Cortland review before there's i i think there's some some similarities there if something else pops into my head i'll i'll, I'll definitely uh i'll definitely shout it out to you but hey send and send and in, in, in some of my favorite places you know you you swing and miss for a while and then when you hit one it makes it even it makes it even better mm -hmm. for sure absolutely i see in your my form that you wrote for haiti um yes you proved to show that poets have no borders they are borderless uh, would you mind uh, rendering the poem and tell us what inspired you to write the poem sure Th thank <laughs> you're you're hitting the tuning fork of my heart with all your the questions that that, that, <laughs> that, that you're asking so in a, in a in a sentence the shorter i get the more devastated i am by the idea of hyper capitalism and, and and when the when the when the terrible earthquakes and after effects came to Haiti, and then I started to read and to hear whisperings, and also the bridges and the water and the electricity and the homes were so often nepotistically given to somebody who built things with the cheapest qualities. It just even further devastated me. I, I, I just want to say to the billionaires, you could stay a billionaire. Let's have a green new world and let's just make things and just bring it back down several notches from the ridiculous. So that is so much in this poem titled Help, It Is Coming, that I wrote from Haiti. There's a character in here named Minnow, and and, and, and and Minnow, I've written literally hundreds of poems about. I don't know if a book of Minnow and I getting together will ever see the world. One of the things I have to say in criticism about myself, I have a wonderful writing practice where I produce every day. It's much harder going back and being my own editor curator you all know when you're writers you know exactly what i'm talking about so let's let's hear this poem for haiti it begins with a quote from barbara ducharme he rocks back and forth in a trance eyes rolling in his head help it is coming a boy stands small beside a tunnel passers-by whisper in woola for french the tunnel steps Ascend by turns like ginger or fawn. Below, some call him a god, some call him the devil. The wall behind them once read, Francois Duvalier eats Dolly Madison's pastries. Now maybe Doc eats paste. The boy is called Mignon. I misunderstand and name him Minnow. He appears inside my brain in November 2009. I didn't speak Latin. I still don't. Wait for me outside the rubble and the blood. I will call through you like a drop of water in your ear. The first two sentences I translated were, I cannot control where I land and sorry about your phone. Then I dropped it in the sink. Minnow possessed me to write this poem in January. The last thing we said together, help, it is coming. In my visions, he was harder than mahogany and softer than onyx. I think water is time's most perfidious disguise. I think he was our only God. Fantastic. Mm. Uh, 
I'm very pleased to uh, understand. Even the lines are not too difficult and it's so straightforward for people to get. And as always been saying, there is no way you call yourself a poet and you create a border for yourself. Uh, you are borderless. As long as anything affects humanity, you are affected. Not only your own world alone. So that is very, very powerful. And I really appreciate your, your, your presentation and the message within your poems. Not only how it is coming, even the rest of the poems that you have written and some of the activities you've been getting yourself involved in gathering writers, giving them the platform to convey your message, I mean, their message to the world. Uh, please, mm -hmm. your final message to our viewers at home while we're planning to round up the show today. Okay. Thank you all so much for, for listening. And I would just say, please go out into the world with an open heart and meet the world with curiosity. Mm -hmm. Make art and make each day your own work of art. Thank you so well, thank much. Thank you very much for being on the show. You know, terrific stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. We had a great time having you. So this has been the New York Parrot Literary Corner. And I am Dustin Pickering. We had Paul Kanicki today. And the lesson we are left with is go out, make art, be open. And we are borderless here as poets. We expand and we grow and we learn. And the best way to do that is to satisfy your curiosity. Don't be afraid of it. Subscribe to our channel. You will get more fantastic content. And we plan to have more poets and more poets and more poets. So also writers, artists, all kinds of variety of people. And we hope you enjoy it. And if you do, do subscribe to our channel. Enjoy. Thank you. This is New York Parrot Literary Corner. Thank you, Paul.